order in the court. It's time for Understanding the Law Radio. Well, hi, and thanks for joining me for another episode of Understanding the Law Radio. I'm your host, Peter Lamont, and today is Halloween, October 31st, 2023. Happy Halloween, everybody. Uh, Lots to go over today. First of all, where have I been? Podcast has been relatively quiet for the last few months, and that's because I have some big news going to be rebranding the podcast to focus more on some of the pop culture law that I really love talking about. It's really where the the podcast has kind of gone organically on its own just because I happen to be a pop culture guy. A lot of references to um, 70s, 80s, 90s, and and current pop culture and the tie-in to the law. So We've been working on rebranding the podcast, coming out with some brand new episodes. So uh, stay tuned for that. We're hoping that we get that launched before Thanksgiving, but we are going to be back with regular podcasts today. uh, It's just me, no Brendan, but uh, we've got a really great show and we're going to talk about some Halloween focused lawsuits and other interesting legal issues. And then, um, I might circle around and and play some snippets from some of our past favorite Halloween podcast episodes that we've done on the show. But let's get started right off the bat with something that I wrote about yesterday on the blog, Lizzie Borden, right? Now, who didn't grow up remembering the, I'm probably going to forget it, but the, uh, the, the rhyme, the poem, Lizzie Borden took an ax and gave her mother 40 wax when she saw what she had done, she gave her father 41. I think that's it. If I'm wrong, let me know. That just came from memory. Well, there is a really interesting lawsuit that I wrote about um, concerning a trademark infringement case. So in the town of Fall River, where Lizzie Borden is said to still wander the hallways and rooms of the historical Lizzie Borden house, Miss Lizzie's Coffee opened up just down the street and it made for quite the fight this past summer, which was finally decided just the other day by a court. Now, so let's get some context to this. If you've never been to the Lizzie Borden house, it's worth a go. Um, I remember going there a couple years ago, maybe four years ago, um, on the way back from a hockey tournament with my my son and it's uh you know it's owned by a company it's owned by uh an llc i believe it's u.s ghost adventures and it's you know the the admission fee is low and you go in and you see the house and it is the historic house where lizzie borden allegedly killed her parents bludgeoned them to death and you can go take a tour of all the rooms of the house. You go with the tour guide and you get to see the, the you know, the, the kitchen, the, the bedroom and all this sort of thing. And as a matter of fact, you can even, I don't know if they, they still do it, but when I went, you could book the house and you can stay there. It's like you could like do a sleepover in the Lizzie Borden house. And I'm sure if you follow any of like the ghost hunter shows or things of that nature, You've seen episodes where these ghost hunters go in and they use their little ghost Geiger devices and they look for Lizzie Borden's spirit, you know, around the house and that sort of thing. Um, If my recollection serves, at least this is what they told me when I went to the Lizzie Borden house, that it is one of the most haunted places in the United States. Now, I went. I did not feel, hear from, or see any ghosts. But that doesn't mean they're not there. It just means that the day that I was there, they were out. Um, but again, it's a fun experience, and it's a host, you know historic house, historic event. So down the street, to bring us back to this lawsuit, this other company opens up a coffee shop. And... 
there is, it's called it's called Miss Lizzie's Coffee. Now, here's the the interesting thing here. So, U.S. Ghost Adventures, who owns the house, owns the trademark for the hatchet emblem, right? So, remember, Lizzie Borden took an axe, and they own this trademark for the the hatchet. They don't own the name Lizzie Borden because it's not something you could trademark. It's not something you could own. It's somebody's name. It's a historical figure. But they got very upset when Miss Lizzie's Coffee Shop opened up and they used, obviously, images of Lizzie Borden within the walls of the shop and had a placard outside, a sign, with a logo that also had a different style hatchet. All right. So what what do they do when they don't like what's going on? What does anybody do in America when they don't like going what's going on? They sue somebody. So the U.S. Ghost Adventures, the owner of the house, sues the coffee shop, asks the court for a preliminary injunction to prevent them from using or or displaying the signage and you know, they're, they're like, oh, this is infringing on what we own, our, our trademark. There's this likelihood of confusion. That was part of the argument. So just the other day, the judge finally ruled on this and said that the likelihood of, of the coffee shop causing confusion, confusion among its, its patrons because of this hatchet emblem is Slim to none. They basically, the judge says that the hatchet emblem that Miss Lizzie's Coffee uses diverges from the trademarked hatchet of the U.S. Ghost Adventures. And then they go back to the name of Lizzie, of course, which, in reference to Lizzie Borden, doesn't infringe on the Ghost Tour Company's trademark of the full name Lizzie Borden in the realm of the hotel. So remember I said a few minutes ago that you can't own the name Lizzie Borden, but... There's trademark law is not as simple as what people often think. You just don't pick a phrase, a word, a slogan, a, a, a design and say, all right, I'm going to trademark this for everything in the universe and you can never use it. So while you might not be able to trademark the name Lizzie Borden. So, for example, if my last name was Borden and I had a kid and decided to call her Lizzie, you, they couldn't sue me for that. But they do own the trademark for the Lizzie Borden Hotel. So it's a particular class where they have the rights to that. But the judge said here that the coffee shop is completely different than the hotel. And the fact that they're using Lizzie or Lizzie Borden at the coffee shop doesn't interfere or infringe on that class of trademark that U.S. Ghost Tours owns because it's not a hotel, right? So imagine if the coffee shop was a hotel and they called it, you know, the Lizzie's Hotel and they used the hatchet sign. Well, then maybe U.S. Ghost Adventures would have had a stronger case because maybe a judge would have said, you know, likelihood of confusion here. People aren't going to know the difference between the two hotels. They're so substantially similar. But the difference between a coffee shop and a hotel are it's vast right and on top of that the logos didn't look the same so that's how they ruled on the lizzie borden issue and it's perfect because the judge just ruled and it's halloween amazing right you couldn't ask for better timing now quickly just to talk about trademarks just to give you the five second rundown what the courts look at for trademarks when they're determining whether or not it's infringing is they look at a few things. One of them is likelihood of confusion. They look at whether the average consumer is going to be confused or could be confused about the source of the goods or services because it's too similar, right? It's substantially similar to a mark that has been filed. They also look at the strength of the mark, the distinctness and and recognition of the mark in the marketplace. Um, you know, they're inclined, the courts are inclined to provide broader protection to marks that are fanciful, right? That are, um, you know, more creative than generic. So, you know, like the Pepsi logo, 
that's creative, right? And it's not as generic as, let's say, a picture of a cat. Okay, so they, they look at the strength of the mark. They also look at the proximity of the goods and services, you know, um, how close is one to the other? So like in this case with Lizzie, it's a coffee shop versus a hotel, not really close. They also consider evidence of actual confusion. You know, are there reviews online where a customer says, I went to go to the Lizzie Borden house and got so turned around, I ended up in the Lizzie Borden coffee shop. You know, if that had happened, obviously the court might have said, wow, you know, this, look, this is evidence that people can be confused. They also look at a few other things overlapping marketing um, and marketing channels, the intent of the use of the mark, likelihood of expansion of the mark, and the sophistication of consumers. So, you know, the higher the degree of, of, of consumer sophistication might lower the likelihood of confusion. So it all hinges on this, this focal point of the, the likelihood of confusion, and then they look at all these other factors to determine whether or not there is any and in this case, Lizzie's Coffee Shop is free to brew their coffee and to just kill the competition because the judge said so. So I thought that was interesting. I want to talk about a couple other ones that just came up in the news. I, also interesting. So I hate clowns. Hate them. I remember when I was a kid, right, we used to go down to the Jersey Shore and they had the wheels where, you know, you, you know what they are, right? You go down to the boardwalk, you put your money on a number or a symbol or whatever, and you spin the wheel, and if you land on it, you get the prize. So I remember being a kid, going down to the Jersey Shore with my parents and winning this clown in this plastic bubble. Now, why the hell he was in a plastic bubble? I have no idea. The clown's name was Corky, and I didn't, I didn't name him Corky. That's what it was. It was Corky the Clown. And, and I'm assuming he was called Corky because his feet were felt, but they had like a cork or styrofoam leg that was shoved up into the pant leg of the clown clothes and the same with his arms. So like you could pull his feet out and his little styrofoam leg would come out too. Now, I thinking about it today as an adult, I'm terrified. Why did I have Corky the Clown? And I remember him. He was green, not his skin, but his his outfit was green. So like when you won the clown, you could pick what color stupid clown you wanted. I picked green because I remember my my room when I was a kid had like this green shag carpet. So there Corky sat in my room in a bubble, in a plastic bubble, staring at me. And all was fine. He stayed around for some, some time. And then I grew tired of Corky. We put him away, put him in the attic. And eventually, my mother took me to see the movie Poltergeist. Now, for those of you who haven't seen Poltergeist, it's a classic. And as you can imagine, there's a tie-in. There's a clown. And I remember sitting in the movie theater. I don't know how old I was. I was young, right? I don't even remember what year. It was early 80s for Poltergeist, I believe. Sitting there, and all was good until the clown scene. Now I'm scared out of my mind because I don't like clowns to begin with, but now this clown has scared the living crap out of me. I get home, I'm crying, and I know that Corky the Clown is in the attic, sitting there waiting for me to fall asleep so he can open up the attic stairs, come down, put his little cork hands over my mouth, and kill me. I know it. So, of course, I'm making a big scene, telling my parents they have to get rid of Corky the Clown. And so my father goes up into the attic. They, they grab the maniacal clown, still encased in his plastic bubble, and they throw him in the garbage, and that was the last that I saw of Corky. So, needless to say, I don't like clowns. I've never liked them. I don't think they're funny. I think they're evil. I think that if there were two things in this world that I had to say scared me the most or disgusted me the most, because one of them doesn't scare me per se, snakes and clowns. So I'm like Indiana Jones when it comes to snakes 
And I don't know who I'm like when it comes to clowns, but clowns just terrify me. So I'm not the only one, though. All right. This past summer, a decision in a case named Munoz versus Six Flags in St. Louis, a Missouri court had to deal with a claim that originated back in 2019 during Fright Fest. So if you've ever been to Fright Fest, you know that there are characters dressed up. They walk around with fake chainsaws and they try to scare people. Well, this plaintiff was at the park for about three hours and he faced, actually she, faced various characters including 10 occasions, now this is what was alleged in the complaint, where, the, where um, she ran, she was so scared, it was like a jump scare, and it was these clowns, and, and she got scared. So 10 times. So she's on her way towards the Mr. Freeze ride, and a scary clown jumps out and guess ran. Now, it's alleged that the clown was about six feet away from the plaintiff, as she was walking towards him when she saw him and she got scared and she ran and tripped over a curb and injured herself. So she sued the park for negligence saying that they didn't maintain a safe environment. Now you've got clowns walking around, scaring the daylights out of people. It's not a safe environment to begin with, but what do you think happened here? So so think about this. Let's just break this down for a second. Person goes to Fright Fest, right? And you presume that that person is fully aware of what's happening at Fright Fest. It is not going to be something not related to Fright, right? I mean, come on, common sense. You know what you're getting to or getting into when you get to Fright Fest. And I, I've been there. I know they have warning signs up i know they have disclaimers up i know they talk about what they do and you know again if if you're curious go look it up online right i mean there's there's plenty of resources available so number one you know you're going to fright fest you know it's going to be scary now you get there and you're scared okay and you're you're being chased by maniacal clowns with chainsaws they're not touching you they're just jump scaring you and and people run and you know this particular person ran and fell over a curb so what do you think happens do you think that six flags is responsible for her injuries well i'm not going to make you wait i'm going to tell you but i'd love you love for you to just think about it before i give my answer make up your mind do you think this plaintiff gets money for falling over a curb while running from a scary clown at Fright Fest. You ready? Okay, the answer is the court ruled against her. They found that the park only had a duty to make conditions generally safe for for the average person, reasonably safe. There was nothing defective about the curb. There was nothing defective about the premises. And the fact that you are going to Fright Fest Fright Fest means that you're aware or should have been aware of the risk. You know, and that risk was being surprised or startled or, you know, chased by a maniacal clown. So, you know, in that case, plaintiff gets nothing. And look, I mean, I get it, but come on. And and I got to say, I like to see when courts don't always find in favor of a personal injury plaintiff. Because I just see too many courts just like giving in or these cases settle and somebody who does not deserve to recover ends up getting money just because either the other side wants to settle and make it go away or the the courts are just, you know, I don't know whether it's the jury that's too sympathetic. So I like to see every, every once in a while when a court can look at the facts and they can do the right thing and and in this case in my opinion it seems like they did all right now the last one that i'm going to talk about today is about creating your own haunted house so we've talked about this in the past but this one 
happened in in 2021. And the individual was a former exotic dancer. Her name was the pole assassin, by the way. Um, And she and her emotional support pet monkey ended up in a lawsuit. Why, you ask? Well, because she decided that she was going to convert her house into a house of horrors along with a maze. And unfortunately, her monkey did not enjoy what was going on and acted aggressively acted acted aggressively towards a child who was visiting the haunted house and bit the kid's hand and wouldn't let go so of course lawsuit and um what happens is that the court finds in favor of the child um there's so much to it because there were claims of animal liability, license liability, negligence, nuisance. Um, and the court found in favor of some of those claims, ultimately I believe the case settled, which is the, the outcome of the entire thing. But it's interesting because I know in the past on episodes we've talked about the fact that, you know, what liability do you have if you set up a really scary um, display in your front yard or whatever and you've got kids trick-or-treating and you jump out and scare them? And I've talked about in the past how um, there was one house in my neighborhood where a guy would do that. He'd, like, sit himself in an open-faced coffin and as kids came up to get coffee, he'd jump out and scare the crap out of them. He was probably the only house on the block that was left with all his candy. I don't remember seeing anybody ever get to the door to get the candy because as soon as he jumped, they walked towards the steps, he jumped out of the coffin, and they ran like hell. So he probably ended up keeping, I'd say, 90% of all the candy that he had purchased to give to trick-or-treaters. Great, great plan if you are trying to... um, just i guess i eliminate any feelings of guilt you know you don't want to buy the candy for yourself and and like just sit home and eat the candy but if there's leftover candy because trick-or-treaters didn't take it then there's no guilt associated with you eating the candy i think that's how it works so he didn't have to feel guilty because nobody got to the door but there was a, a a kid who um was with a parent and the parent ended up having a heart attack. And and so that was a big ordeal and and obviously became an issue. But in the case of, of this monkey house, I think it really serves as a good lesson because you can't just go and open up a haunted house. There are all these different licenses, approvals, whether it's local or, or state, you have just can't go and say, Hey, I'm going to have a haunted house in my basement. Everybody come on over. It's going to be great. And then not be concerned with liability. You know, your your homeowner's insurance might not cover haunted houses. Um, the town might not permit it. There's so many things that can go wrong. So the takeaway, I think, from the monkey, I keep wanting to say monkey boo. Do you guys know who monkey boo is from YouTube? Monkey boo. If not... This is guy and his monkey, Monkey Boo. And I saw it a couple times, and now every time I think of a monkey, I mean, the branding is, is magnificent because any time I think of a monkey, I think of Monkey Boo. And I'm not even trying to think of Monkey Boo. And it also has nothing to do with Halloween. It's Monkey Boo's in my head. Every time I say monkey, my brain automatically says Monkey Boo. Anyway, anyway, the story here with the monkey is that you have to investigate and do your due diligence before you engage in any sort of of opportunity, whether it's business-related or even if it's just for fun. You think it's fun to have a haunted house. Maybe you weren't charging admission. You know, um, just it it leaves leaves open a lot of, of, of liability and risk, and it's not just something that you should do lightly. And, and you know, Let's just go to pop culture for a second. 
there's this this series of films. I believe there's three of them called Hell House LLC. Um, they're pretty good actually, and it's like a found footage film. And I'm not going to give it away, but it its premise is that there's a hotel um, where satanic rituals at one point had gone on, and um, somebody you know tries to convert it to a haunted house. So that is interesting because while it's certainly fantasy and pop culture and and you know i'm, I'm not suggesting that uh, the monkey's house you know with uh, the pole assassin was haunted in any way um it just you know obviously in the film right there, there was something satanic that had gone on you, your due diligence your your negligence your duty before you'd open up a haunted house there would be to fully investigate and disclose. Now, again, we're talking about a movie. We're not talking about real life. But I do have a, a blog post up about whether or not you have to disclose if there's a haunting or anybody died at a house you're trying to sell. So if you're interested in that, check that out um, because that's a real thing. But my point is that you just, you know, you just don't jump into things without fully investigating them and doing due diligence and understanding what it is that your risks are. And even if it's something fun like a haunted display or a trick-or-treat maze or whatever, just, you know, you got to look into it. Just don't think you can do it and, and have no issue. And, you know, that brings me to another interesting haunt, which I, I've, you know, been interested in just from a legal standpoint. It's McCamey Manor. Um, have any of you heard of that? It, it, it's pretty interesting. So if you don't know anything about it, just take a second and look it up. McCamey Manor. It is this haunted attraction and, and survival horror place that, and I, I use place lightly because I'm not sure if there's actually a place anymore. It's owned by um, this gentleman named Russ McCamey. Uh, and it's been on the news. It's something that, you know, comes up all the time, and there's a significant number of videos about it on YouTube. But basically, it's like this house where if you can complete the house, you're going to get money. I think it's like $20,000 or something, and nobody's ever uh, completed the house. And originally, there was a house. But now there's questions as to whether or not there actually is a physical location. Um, but you take a tour of this manor and you, from what I've seen online and from what I've read in, in you know, news reports and, and attempted litigation, um, that people are actually suffering severe physical and emotional distress there was one participant who visited the manor in 2016 um, and claims that employees tortured her and was she was treated in the hospital. Um, so it's now this location is supposedly in, in Summertown, um, Tennessee, and there's been a ton of complaints by the county and, and other officials. Um, they saw at one point a woman dragged screaming from a van as part of the experience. And of course they say it was staged and not real. The district attorney has been down there claims that the program was legal because people have voluntarily subjected themselves to this event and that it doesn't, um, in any way violate Tennessee law. But, you know, it's really fascinating from a legal standpoint as to how someone could, and again, let's assume that the allegations are, 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 are true, that you go into this event, whether it's house or, or wherever he does it, and you get tortured, right? There's, there's allegations online of being tattooed, of being beaten, of being all these things. Um, and, and there's allegedly footage showing depicting that um how how's that legal simply because you volunteer to do it 
I remember when I was in college, there were these two kids that wanted to start a backyard boxing um, thing. And so they set up a, a boxing ring in, in one of the kids' backyards, and people would go over to the house and volunteer to get in the ring, and you'd, you'd beat the crap out of each other. But the police stopped that real fast. So it's just interesting how this place is allowed to exist and how it sort of just just does enough to avoid real liability. Very interesting. Um, I'm not going to say more about it. I want you to look it up on your own because it's kind of it's kind of fascinating as to how it exists. And, and um, there's one particular YouTuber I was following his story for a while where he was trying to infiltrate and take down McCamey Manor. Um, but very interesting. All right. Well, that is going to do it for this episode. You know, I, I thought that I would maybe throw in some old clips from some of our, our prior Halloween episodes. I think what I might do is just do that on uh, Thursday's show because today's show went a little bit longer than I had planned. So we'll, we'll put that in for Thursday. We'll just make Halloween last a little bit longer. Uh, but that's going to do it for this episode. Make sure that you subscribe to the podcast and that you stay tuned because, like I said, we're going to have um, a, a new uh, a new look podcast with some rebranding and things of that nature, um, focusing more on the pop culture and the law. Since, like I said, that's what we talk about. I mean, even on this show today, we talked a lot about pop culture and, and, and law, and I think that that's a, a pretty fascinating topic, and I, I love it. So... Hopefully you love it too. You're going to love the rebrand. Stick around for it. Make sure that you tell your family and friends about the show. We're back. I know it's been a couple months. I know there's been nothing new, but we are back and, and um, you know, we'll put out the schedule right now. We're going to be um, releasing podcasts every Tuesday and Thursday. We're going to try to stick with that. Um, and then we'll see once the rebrand happens, what we do next but uh we're gonna bring brendan back too because it's always a good time talking with him um you know he's got a different opinion or different uh insight on some things and we got some good banter so we're gonna bring him back we're gonna rebrand and it's gonna be great so thanks for everyone who listens to the podcast and for everyone who subscribes and for those of you who are new welcome um i'm glad you listened to the show i hope you enjoyed it and i hope you stick around for upcoming episodes that's gonna do it and we'll see you next time Thanks for listening to Understanding the Law Radio. If you haven't done so already, make sure that you subscribe to the podcast. We're available anywhere that you listen to your podcasts, including Amazon, Apple Music, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and many more. Also, don't forget to check us out online on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thanks again. See you next time.